advantages an F in fire safety. The next area to examine is the plant management's handling of contaminated waste. The plant generated a lot of scrap during production. Scrap rich in plutonium was recycled right at the plant. Lena residues, including contaminated machine oil, tissues, tools, and gloves that had plutonium in or on them, were often stored on site. The goal here was to find a way to recover the plutonium from these Lena residues and reuse it. Let's look at the way the plant management handled these dangerous contaminated residues. In 1958, Dow established the 903 area, an open field on the site, as an area for storing metal drums filled with machine oils contaminated with plutonium. This was started out as a temporary measure. Dow said they intended to develop a method to reclaim the plutonium from these waste oils. Within a year, the drums were corroding badly. Dow tried adding a rust inhibitor to the barrels, but the corrosion continued. To make matters worse, the drums were not properly labeled, so it was difficult to tell how old the drums were, what they contained, or how much radioactivity could have been released. Four years after 903 area drum storage began, in a document that has since been declassified, a Dow employee reported, quote, about 50 to 60 percent of these drums are badly corroded. The contents of several has already spilled out on the ground. Unless these materials are disposed of in a very near future, a serious contamination problem will develop." End quote. So by 1962, Dow knew that many barrels were leaking. But it's not until 1967, or five years later, that Dow began removing these radioactive drums from the field. By that time, there were more than 5,200 drums, of which over 3,500 contained plutonium. The problem was not simply that the plutonium was now on the soil on the surface of the field. Any disturbance of the soil on the pad could resuspend the plutonium particulates into the air. When the barrels were removed, the contaminated soil below was completely exposed to the winds. The high winds that are typical of this area could and did blow these particulates far off site. Let's look at Dow's attempt to clean up the 903 area. It took a year and a half to remove the barrels from the field. Then the field sat exposed to the elements for two months. Next, Dow burned contaminated vegetation from the area. Again, the field set bare and exposed for three more months. In November of 1968, Dow brought in heavy equipment and graded the area. As you'd expect, this kicked up a lot of radioactive dust. The lot was then allowed to sit exposed for nine more months. When fill and then asphalt were finally applied, Dow's cleanup took nearly three years. Air samples show significant contamination at the time that the work was done on the 903 area. So not only did Dow create a huge mess, but in attempting to clean it up, they actually caused substantial additional releases of plutonium off-site. Since 1969, Dow and then Rockwell generated thousands of additional drums of plutonium and other radioactive residues. These drums have been stored throughout many buildings at the plant site, and most remain on site today. These residues are a catastrophe waiting to happen. Besides residues which contain plutonium and which were thought to be recoverable, the plant generated waste, often contaminated with toxic substances that had to be disposed of. In 1985, it was estimated that Rocky Flats generated an average of almost 32 million pounds of these mixed waste every year. A 1986 agreement between the Department of Energy, the EPA, and the Colorado Department of Health required Rockwell to close solar evaporating ponds that were leaking into the groundwater. These ponds had been used to evaporate water from waste liquids 
and there was contaminated sludge on the bottom of the ponds. To dispose of the sludge, Rockwell decided to mix it with concrete to make a hard material they call pondcrete. They would ship the blocks to Nevada for disposal. But Rockwell never defined the process for making pondcrete. There wasn't even a formula that called for a certain amount of cement. The operators making the concrete just guessed at the amount. As a result, many of the blocks were not hard like concrete. They turned out to be soft like putty. In September of 1986, after some 2,000 concrete blocks had been shipped to Nevada, officials there determined that the concrete Rockwell was shipping contained materials that the Nevada site was not authorized to store. The officials immediately stopped accepting the concrete. Rockwell's response was to store the blocks outdoors on the 750 pad. The concrete was packaged in plastic lined tri-wall cardboard boxes. These boxes were completely inappropriate for outdoor storage of concrete. During this time, there's no evidence that Rockwell management made any backup plans or changes in procedure. The company continued to make semi-soft 1,200 pound blocks containing contaminated waste and to store them in cardboard boxes outside, protected only by tarps that frequently blew off in the high wind. By the end of September 1987, there were over 10,000 cardboard boxes of concrete on the 750 pad. Running out of room, Rockwell began to use the 904 pad as well. Not surprisingly, given these conditions, the boxes began to deteriorate. In May of 1988, a box fell and broke open on the 904 pad. Environmental samples taken soon after showed contamination. In the year and a half between the halting of the shipments to Nevada and the 1988 spill, more than 16,500 blocks were produced and stored in cardboard boxes outdoors. The Department of Energy determined that 9,000 boxes stored outdoors had deteriorated. It will cost hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up this radioactive mess. There's an almost identical story about Rockwell's handling of salt waste. That product was called saltcrete, and it was also poorly made, inappropriately packaged and stored outside, and it also leaked. The examples of extreme mishandling of waste go on and on. Rockwell knowingly misused the 1952 sewage treatment plant and routinely discharged chemicals into the effluent. They knew their system ultimately fed into local communities' drinking water, and yet they continued these practices. Later, Rockwell pleaded guilty to criminal violation of federal environmental laws in each of the concrete, saltcrete, and sewage treatment matters. The 903 pad incident and the violations to which Rockwell pled guilty demonstrate reckless and criminal handling of radioactive waste. Unfortunately, they are not the only examples. Throughout the plant's history, Dow and Rockwell buried, stored, and spilled radioactive and other dangerous waste at the site. Dangerous waste leaked into the soil. This map shows where the known waste sites are today, but no one can say where this waste will go in the future. One reason is that Rocky Flats is the home of many thousands of gophers and other animals and to millions of ants and other insects. These animals dig into the ground and churn up the soil. In most environments, this animal activity is natural and healthy. At Rocky Flats, it can bring deadly nuclear contaminants to the surface where winds can resuspend them. So, as in the past, the radioactivity from nuclear waste buried in hot spots will spread far beyond the plant's boundaries in years and decades to come. Because of poor waste management,